Well, it's Friday and it's just uh, depressingly hot in here. Ugh. Because despite our best efforts, we actually got some real Colorado summer weather, which is reasonably hot and dry, though nothing compared to Arizona. No. 125 degrees Fahrenheit side sidewalks. Uh -huh. Signs are melting. That's crazy. We shouldn't be down there in the first place, but <laughs> in any case, it's Friday. Howdy. Hi. Um, we actually recorded wrist check before making the video. Mm -hmm. Isn't that awesome? Mm -hmm. Okay, hang on. Well, it's wrist check time, so do you it. You go first? Yeah, why not? Okay, I don't know. If it, well, I haven't been around for a while. <laughs> so, um, I've been wearing, thank you, this panda for a while. Pandas are one of my all-time favorites, and I've never had one before, and I'm so used to seeing so many with faded, trashy dials um, that I basically took this one. <laughs> yeah, we got this in a big lot of watches that we bought from a friend of ours, uh, whom I need to call, actually. And I, this one was there, and we've had a lot of these. We've had a lot of this model, and every single one's been sold. Um, but this one, she decided she wanted to keep it. I didn't even know she liked pandas. Well, because most of the time, their dials are trash. Well, I wouldn't say trash. They're heavily patinaed. Oh, it? yes. Well, it depends. It depends. <laughs> and they can patina in all kinds of different ways. It's rare to see one that I don't think is unique and interesting, but there was just something about this top coat which just patinas to this brown, depending. But I'm super glad you like it. Mm-hmm. Cool. Uh, I am, I don't know, I've been having some problems where I've been two-fisting it a lot. Uh -huh. So there's, uh, whoops, come here. There's my first gen AGS Landmaster. I went through, uh, I have to make a follow-up video actually. I went through and replaced the capacitor um, and I did a full rebuild and all that other kind of stuff. So this in theory should only have three days charge because it's a first gen AGS, but I have a modern capacitor in it and it's been running for a couple weeks without charging. So we know that a new capacitor will change these from three days to six months, I'm guessing. Uh, and the other one is, is I finally got end links for this jumbo, the reproduction end links, but they're pretty good. Uh, that's an original bracelet. So there it is. There's my, they call it this, they call this blue dial, they call it the petrol. I don't know if it's petrol like gasoline or petrol like the seabird. But that's a pretty watch, and I'm wearing it because I forgot I was wearing it. This is also one of Sabrina's favorite models. Okay, that's wrist check. Okay, and we're back. Yes, It has are. been, how long has it been since we've done a mail call? God, almost a month. Jeez, oh, Pete. Maybe a month? I don't know. We've just been busy. Yeah. Um, okay, well, do you want me to get started? I guess, so. sorry, I'm talking to the dog. Yeah. Hi, <gasps> Rocket. Hi, Rocket. Oof, it is warm in here. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, let's do it. Checking out Seiko 69JDM catalog. Mm, that was fun. A lot of people say they want me to do more of that. So if you want me to do more of that, just say so and blow and we'll do it. What a catalog. Truly golden age. What a time to be a designer working for Seiko. Seiko really should dip into their back catalog far, far more. They're crazy. Even the Seiko Museum is lackluster in its approach to their own illustrious history bizarre. I guess the the best spin that I ever put on it, if thinking about it myself, is that they, um, you know, they had their glory days because they looked forward. You know, they were they weren't like the Swiss watch industry. They weren't stuck in their ways, and they were looking forward. And so they they produced all this amazing tech. And but that looking forward thing, I think, is still part of their culture. Is that why they don't do correct uh, reissues? They're getting better with those correct But then reissues. they're not looking forward because they're looking backwards for inspiration. I don't know. I think they're testing the waters. It's because now there's a new new reissue. It only like was rumored come out like yesterday. Are they? Yeah, which is a reissue of the 6117 8000 Navigator. The, the smaller like silver one, the yeah. early type. It's got the A movement. And Seiko, it's just like that other, that sport diver recreation. Diggy, what do you want? Um, that we were looking at pictures of where it was like, it was perfect. Mm -hmm. I looked at the pictures of this thing and it's 
It looks really good. The one, some people were saying, well, is this real? Maybe this is a mock-up. It might be, I don't know, but it has a model number, but it has to be modern if it's a real picture because the original had crown at four. This thing has crown at 415, which is a modern Seiko thing to do. We're gonna have to make a choice and try to get one of these in here so I can see it. Mm -hmm. My biggest resistance to that is that they're limited edition models. So they're going to be a bajillion dollars unnecessarily. Unnecessarily. Yeah. They're going to be a bajillion dollars and they're going to vanish into various watch collections. And that'll be that, you know, I don't know. It's if they were selling this stuff, these nice new watches and they were selling them for like the equivalent of what it was back then, five or $600. No, but that's, that's, if you move the, if you move it forward for inflation, that pretty much is what they cost back in the day too. I mean, they cost enough that, you know, Colonel Pogue, before he went up to Skylab, he had his on layaway. Wow. He I had, didn't know that part. Yeah. He had it on layaway at the Air Force PX base. Mm -hmm. Um, he paid 70 bucks, 1971, I think something like that. And, uh, yeah, he, I think multiple payments layaway. Wow. That's crazy. It is. Okie dokie. From Biff Tannen BTTF. Mail call question. I wanted to see if you have any knowledge of the H35750200 Silver Wave Diver. I have one and it seems to only have been made for one month, May in 1982. This is weird. Plus, it doesn't appear in any catalog. Thanks. You know, it's funny. Uh, so I looked this up. I wasn't familiar with it myself. I looked at it and I was like, oh, it's a, it's a baby Arnie. And I showed it to Sabrina and she's like, that's a baby Arnie. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, it's a baby Arnie. But then I was looking at it and I was like, well, there were some things that were weird. It didn't look quite like a baby Arnie. And that's when the, the penny dropped. And I realized that you had said H357, not H558. H357 was the Diney Arnie movement. H3557. Main differences are is that uh, the Dyni H357 is a really nicely made movement. It is all metal. It's, um, it, they're beautifully made. They're, 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 they're jeweled. Um, the only thing I think that the regular H558 SUA movement has on it is it has a light. Other than that, the greatest functioning light. I've ever seen in a watch. Yeah, yeah, you get that. Now, if you get that thing really pumping, really put the power <laughs> through it, you can usually tell what the first number is. Yep. Because it's only on one side. So it's like you have this little firefly on one side. And you, if you squint, you can get it sometimes. <laughs> so anyway, uh, oh, I never finished that thought. It's really cool. That's I've true. never heard of them. I've never seen it. So it's the Diny Baby Arnie, and it's really interesting. H357s are nice movements. They're almost always dress watches, though. Sometimes a silver wave. Um, from Rob Musical. Pretty interesting to see those prices. In the JDM catalog, the base model Seiko 5S accounted for inflation ranged from $240 to $300 in 2023 dollars. The Lord Maddox were about $400, the GS are about $1,000, and the 18 karat gold GS was $4,800. Doesn't that all sound reasonable? Imagine if those watches today, those prices, that seems like a pretty reasonable range. Mm -hmm. Okay. Seiko prices have increased in the last few years, especially at the higher end, and I'm definitely sad that the SKX line was replaced with less feature-rich models. But really, at the entry-level range, Seiko's JDM prices are still in line, mm -hmm. and then the USD catalog prices are even higher. The lowest was $575, and the most expensive non-precious metal one was $1,400. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Seiko tried to move up market. I mean, just thinking about the prices for what you just told me. Those are perfectly normal standard prices. And a lot of Seiko's models end up being in that three, four, five hundred range. The problem is, gosh darn limited editions. And Seiko trying to basically ask more money to make their watches maybe seem a little nicer. And that is a thing that happens. I mean... I mean, when I put up my watches, people, for some reason, got the impression that, uh, you know, 
my rates were reasonable. <laughs> <laughs> you silly. I don't know. I'm just like, I don't get it. And maybe they're making things more expensive because some internet personalities really talk up their stuff and people get interested. Not just me. I know. I know. (laughs) Uh, It was was fun for a while. Um, I'm on Reddit. I have the Seiko subreddit and the Japanese watches subreddit. Um, But I was on the watches subreddit at a certain point, many points. And there would be regular posts from some person saying... I'm 18 or I'm going up to college and I want my first watch. I really want to get some X, Y, and Z. Look in this stuff. And people would say, even people who weren't Seiko fans actually saw this. And one guy was like, I'm not a Seiko fan. I don't like Seiko. But for what you're asking in terms of bang for buck, SKX 007. Yep, I've seen that cannot, too. You cannot beat it. And so Seiko could have made those damn things forever. People would still be buying them. Mm-hmm. I mean, I built a, I built one for a guy, custom. I custom built one for a dude out of NOS parts. And back in the old days, you know, people would ask the question on the old forum and they'd say, what do you think is going to be a future classic? And I was like, 007. And they were like, nah, you'll be able to find them forever. I found one mint in box for blank. That's great. You know, in the early 1980s, wow. The Volkswagens that I could buy in the early 1980s for almost nothing. How about the Vespas? And the Vespas. A Vespas. I got my beautiful, beautiful Super 150. I loved my idiot brother. Never mind. Uh, (laughs) That was was 90 bucks. 90 bucks. Did you get one for free? I I did. I've I've got, um, well, I got a... I got a Volkswagen Beetle for free. I thought you got a uh, Vespa because it was tied to a sh- or chained to a street. Post. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah! It was in San Francisco. It was up on um, Dolores and like Twenty Fourth, mm-hmm. maybe maybe a little further. But yeah, it was this Vespa that had been chained to a palm tree, and it had been there for so long that there was, I believe, mold on the part. Not mold, but like mossy things on it. And I went up to the front door. I remember we, I was there with my, my buddy Eric Diaz. And I went up to the front door. And I, I don't remember. Somebody must have answered. Or we left a note. No, somebody must have answered. We're like, what's the deal? And they're like, we have no idea. It's, it's been there for as long as we own this place. And I was <laughs> like, well, w- 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 what if we take it? They're like, it's not ours. So I don't know. We don't care. It's been there for as long as we've owned the house. So we cut, the, we cut it and we took it. Uh, anyway, um, okay. I... Whatever happened to that one? You know, the coolest motorcycle, talking about stuff you could get back in the day, Dolores, where it meets market, uh, between um, the Orbit Room and the Safeway, that's right there, right in that strip below the Mint, there was for many years, when I first moved there, 1991, there was, there was an Indian motorcycle with the inverted four-cylinder engine chained to one of those palm trees. I mean, it's a really rare walk, uh, rare, not watch, really rare motorcycle. I mean, they are worth a lot of money. And it was just chained up on this thing year after year after year. Tires were completely flat. The jade tree thing that it was tied to was growing through its wheels. Years and years and years, and I was always thinking, man, I should find out who owns that thing. And one day it was gone. Well, That's it. I'm okay with that because, you know, you'd be more likely to smash your head off. I found a Triumph Tiger motorcycle in a, uh, in a snow drift. And, uh, Where? No, uh, actually, right close to, you know, when... Um, uh, that same plaza where Sadie goes gaming and where the yeah, Lamar's yeah, 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 Donuts yeah, yeah. Yes, is, yes, 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 yes. it was right there by that gas station um, one winter because my apartment was right behind there. That's where I lived at the time. And this we'd had some huge snowstorm and it was melting down. It was melting out and there was like motorcycles sticking out of this snow. And I went, I picked it up and it was a, a Triumph Tiger, which is was kind of like their sport bike, like kind of a dirt bike. And it was missing its instrument cluster and headlight. But I'm like, it was a triumph. So I called up the only motorcycle shop in town at that time, which was Classic Touch. You know that old old guy, like um, the Harley place, right up when you're going up Riverside. Oh, okay, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The old guy, old guys. 
These dudes, they had a non-functioning elevator in there and the shaft was motorcycle models they did not like. And I was looking down into it and there were like BMW R series motorcycles, which are worth crazy money now. But anyway, I called the guy up and he's like, oh yeah, I mean, you could do it, but those, they aren't worth anything. There's just no point. Why would you want to? Yeah, why would anybody want a free 1960s Triumph Tiger for free? Hunter S. Thompson would have kicked you in the head. <laughs> Probably. Mm -hmm. Probably. Now can I go to the next question? I guess so. Well, Biff. yeah, because you're going to run out of time yep. soon. Yes. Uh, Biff Tannen, BTTF again. Uh, question for you. I just got a 1969 5126603 double hurricane, and it has a serial 980001. What does this mean in terms of production? I burped. You burped. <laughs> Is there more to the question? Yeah. Um, I don't understand really because obviously Seiko made more than 9,999 watches per month. Was mine the first or just the first at Dini? I've never understood how their production worked. Thanks, guys. My guess, this isn't my knowledge, but this is my guess. And by the way, if you have to take off, I mean, I can look at the notes and I can read my own questions. I mean, That's I'm okay. capable of doing it. Um, I forgot the question. It's okay. Good. I don't even think you put all the questions I on didn't? There. Well, what was the one you just read? I just read... Uh, oh, maybe you didn't get the updated one or I didn't save it. Okay. Okay. So the way the numbers worked, as far as I know, in the early, late fifties and going up into the early sixties to about 67, Seiko had a seven digit serial, which I have always believed was the production for a month. So, you know, seven digits, that's, well, that's what a you know, that's a lot, what, a million something on watches in a month? Is that right? What? Seven digits. I don't know. Don't and ask me to do math. I'll check it. Anyway, uh, but then in like 68, they went to six digits. My belief is that they were making too many watches for the seven and models to make for the seven digit work. So they went to the six digit. Again, this is only my belief. They went to the six digit and then it would have a corresponding data point that was the model number. So you would have, boom, the model and the serials. We made X number of these this month. So yours would have been the first model, first one of those produced in that month. The first one with uh, August, night, wait, is it eight, six or six, eight, probably eight, six. Oh. Well, whatever. So that's, that's the thing. It would be that month. That year and yours was probably number one. And I was thinking... That's of, crazy. Yeah, I was thinking a few weeks ago. I'm like, you know, you just... And I was like, I don't think I can remember ever having one that was number one. I've had eight. Um, I think the coolest thing I ever had I'm is... I'm going to go. Oh, you have to go? Coolest thing I ever had was two true pogues that were like 70 units apart. Excuse me. Okay, well... I love you. Drive safe. Oh, I've got to uh I've got to get my own questions then if I'm doing this. Sorry. Oh what? I don't care. Oh right, I was looking for my phone. I was like <laughs> there it is. There's my phone. So let's go like this. Let me put this here. Look what I got, people. Peoples of Earth. My MGB manual. Cause I've got my uh I've got my engine hoist came in and I've got my engine stand and I'm gonna be able to pull that engine, and I'm talking soon, you're going to hear it cracking, bitching, and moaning uh, because there's apparently no food on the planet that she's willing to eat. She might be complaining that it's too hot. Okay. Joseph Stewart. Hey, S&S. &S. Question for next mail call. I recently purchased yet another 7548, this time a JDM 7548-7000C orange dial. Um, uh, it's now, uh, blah, 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 and so you got it next to a 7548-7000JDM, 7548-7000B Pepsi. I'm happy to have all three, though I hope one day to get the rare as hen's teeth teal dial variant. Made for one month. Um, on my questions, 
The 7000C JDM is gorgeous and recently serviced and it is pretty great condition. The only thing I'm not so sure about is the bezel insert. It's definitely an original 7548 insert with some wear, but the markers are not gold. They just look like more uh, the insert of my black 7548 uh, or my 6309. Is it common for the gold to fade over the years? Lots of love from Morpeth, Australia. What a great town name, Morpeth. That's wild. Um, yeah, it is actually normal for the gold to fade. Uh, I, I actually have, well, you know, why don't I put in a segment? I'll do some show and tell. Okay, gold inserts. So here's a pretty good example of really good. It has some wear, but you can see it's got the, the black uh, satiny pebbled finish. Uh, that's correct for these. And that's sort of the deep anodized gold. I probably need to clean that dial. You see, yeah, look at the sort of the pebbly pattern on it. And of course the angle right here. See that little, see the little inside curve right there? Yeah, nobody makes those. Nobody, well, nobody makes them correctly, I should say. Isn't that a beautiful watch? Holy cow. Original Z bracelet. Okay, so that's what, this is what really okay, mostly unfaded or whatever. That's how that goes. Here is our next example. Uh, this is in a modded case that, uh, so just ignore that. The rest of the watch is original. And you can see gold versus faded gold. It's just a little lighter. Surface is a little worn down, it's more smooth. There's a story behind that. I wish I had the correct case back. Somebody took one of these a long time ago and did this to it, but you know, I have to say it's a nice looking job. Any case, so there you go. There's a slight fade. And so now let's put these down here. Here's an even lighter fade. Let's look at side by side. You can see just the, the sort of the orangey richness of it is, of the insert is really faded down. But you can still see all the same things. Note the, you know, the bevel on the inside of the insert and that it, that it the, the triangle goes right over the edge. Again, it's a little worn smooth. Interesting, the black actually is a little bit of a blue cast. Huh. It's interesting. Okay, so we've got one, two, three, three examples. And lastly, I dug through my crap. This is, I believe, a 6159 or a, maybe even a 6215. Well, well, I'll just say 6159 gold insert. Believe it or not, it is. You can just see it. Mostly you can see it like in the reflection face on it just looks silver. Yeah, you can see it just look, it's got a little bit of gold cast there. And look, it's got a little bit of that blue color too. I had this for so long and didn't realize that it was gold tone. Because no. these, these when, the, when they were new, they were as gold as that. Isn't that crazy, huh? What time does. Hmm. Maybe someday I'll build it. So there you go. Okay, this question or these questions are about the overdue review I did of the Seiko Marine Master 300. I, I I keep wearing it. The only reason I'm not wearing it right now is that I'm finally I'm finally wearing my AGS Gen 1 uh, Kinetic Landmaster. Okay, Marine Master. Jeff1176 says there is no question the Marine Match Master is clearly the watch to have. I well. 
You know the biggest disqualifier for Rolex? The price tag. Um, for me. Other than that, they are nice watches. You know, but they're just watches. They're all just watches. But it has a nice old school feeling. It, it feels like a grandfather's watch. It feels like it has history attached to it. But I have to say the Marine Master is just... I've been wearing it for weeks. And it just... Every time I look down, it just grabs me. I love the way it looks. Um... But that's me, and I'm biased. Next question, jump7548. People complain about the bracelet, but I found that it's actually fairly solid. The extension was enough to get over my dry suit, as a matter of fact. Wow. Unfortunately, I maimed the clasp quite badly when I was very drunk. Now it lives on an isoframe. Edit. I have actually had the extension bend during a dive. Well, I agree, not completely safe, better on rubber. Yeah, ever since the the Hawaii, you know, barnacle MM300, it didn't actually have barnacles on it, but it had marine growth. I have been looking sideways at those diver extensions because uh, they seem a little, I was surprised that it would have broken there, but it did. But I thought maybe it was a rare thing. And then I got my second gen titanium Landmaster that had the same thing. And this watch has almost no miles on it. I mean, very few wrist hours. And it just, without warning, that diver extension just broke, just snapped. And the, the two connections are these tiny little finger-like extensions of thin metal with um, square corners so that they are uh, force concentrators um, and they'll crack right there. It's just a poor design. Uh, it's just it's just nuts. Um, you'd think they would have done better. But I have to say, people, I mean, it's a heavy watch and I'm aware of it, but man, the bracelet, the, 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 the bracelet is part of it for me because even though it's fairly imposing in terms of weight, it's really elegantly done and the brushing is super nice and it's got this like really fine taper which is awesome because at the time Seiko was was all about making really big heavy clunky solid stainless bracelets that was the that was the style at the time um, and so everything was like bigger and heavier and check it strap code, you know, you know, super super um, super presidents and stuff like that but the 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 Marine Master one is just it's just graceful and it's really beautifully finished and it just it suits the watch I don't know I'm just talking about for myself my own personal opinion I really like it the only thing that would make the watch better is if they had found a way to lighten the case somehow but you know what are you going to do I love it and the only reason I'm not wearing it now is because I'm wearing the Kinetic. Okay. Connor Whitworth. Hello, Connor. Speaking of the MM300. Because they were hand-loomed. That's what he's talking about. The uneven loom is so utterly charming. Definitely hand-applied. A modern masterpiece for sure. The handset has to be one of the very best from any watch at any price point. I agree with both points 100%. The Marine Master handset... That was Sorry about that. My alarm went off. The Marine Master handset is, it's just an exquisite handset, a masterpiece of industrial design. They're so beautiful. A, a wonderful reinterpretation of the original hand design from the 6215s and the 6159-7000s. They are just, they're just beautiful. The hands are gorgeous. Um, and the watches were hand built and they had, you know, a lot of hand finishing done on the exteriors. And yeah, man, those dials were hand loomed and it just shows there is, there's something about the rumpliness of it, the uniqueness of it. It, it makes it seem like a more living design. It wasn't just cranked out by, you know, by a, a robot. Not that there's anything wrong with things getting cranked by robots. Um, probably the future of dating for many people. Um, sorry, that just came out. But yeah, it's it's very charming. And it's true to of other big tunas like um, 7C46,000 meter dark tunas. Those things are hand-loomed. 
I had a Darth Tuna and I got rid of it. Every time I've had two and I've gotten rid of two and I wish I'd kept the one. Well, what are you going to do? I mean, at the time, what are you going to do? Super Cruise. The MM300 is an insanely good watch for the money. And the SBDX001 in good condition are becoming harder and harder to find. I agree. Um, the bracelet makes these watches very heavy, so I wear mine on the rubber strap. I have the SBDX017, a keeper for sure. Enjoy. Would love to hear your thoughts on a tool to remove the winding weight on those 8L35s. Um, I can show you. I don't have the tool. I don't have it, so I made one. Uh, here, let me show it to you. So the question is about the 8L35. Now, I can't show you this because it's inside a solid case, and I'm not going to take this apart. But most of the Seiko's automatic Seiko's, the, the winding weights are just held on with just like a single screw. That's the way they've pretty much always done it. But not this one. It's got a triple screw on there, or like a screw down thing with three diddlies. You need a, like a three poke honk pronger. I don't have one. Seiko will not sell them, so I made one. And I tell you what, folks, it works. Yep, I made one. Because I just didn't want to wait. And again, they didn't sell them, so that's what I had to do. I forgot I even had this. I work on 8Ls pretty, pretty infrequently, like basically never. And uh, so, good to have this around, but I had to write a note on it. Seiko 8L tool, important. That's, a, that's an understatement. PH69 JBL, uh, talking about the Marine Masters and how you take, uh, how you resize them, how you take links out of them, because they use this thing called the pin and collar system, which is just, it's, you have to use nitpicking concentration and preventative measures to not lose those stupid collars. Um, so changing them is pain in the neck. Okay, so PH69 JBL. If Spencer says it's a pain in the neck to resize the MM300 bracelet due to the crazy pin and collar system, makes me feel much better since every time I do that, I feel like I'm doing brain surgery while I'm balancing on a rope of the Grand Canyon. Yeah, and it's nerve wracking. Though it is so common to lose those things that if you if you call or email Seiko in, in Maywa, New, Marwa, New Jersey, um, and request three free monster links, uh, well, at least they always used to just, they would just send them to you. They didn't even charge you for them. So you'd get a box with three monster links in it with their pin and collars. They would do that rather than just sell the collars themselves. They'd just send you three extra links and they may still do that. Because it's such a pain in the ass. Anyway, I'm going to make a little segment here, and I'll, I'll show those, too. Seiko's pin and collar system. That's what these have. So what this means is you have this. This is a bracelet fixing pin. And this is an actual, genuine Marine Master link. The very first of these that I own, some, some towering intellect brought one brand new decided he didn't like the shiny surfaces and scotch brighted the whole thing. Yeah, so this is this is one of the original links from that watch. And you can see what he did. He just ground it down. But on the inside, it is still a Marine Master link. So you got this little baby. Let's see if I can get this in tighter. As she said. Okay, so let's see. So you've got, try that. Yeah, good enough. Okay, so you've got, I don't know if you can see it. One side, bigger, gosh darn it. Okay, so one side, mother. Okay, one side is bigger. The other side is smaller. And I don't know if you can see, if you look in there, see that black 
line that's circling around the inside there, that hole, that's where the, the diameter of the hole necks down. And that is for this. See how it's got this expanded end? So it goes in like so, like that. Okay, great, wonderful. And then this uh, can just slide around, but it's not that easy. It goes into this collar, this thing, that piece rides in the middle of the link and it just sits there because it's gonna it's and it's a force fit it's a friction fit through the pin and the combination of the two the pin and the collar it, the pin can't move out of the link but it also i think it prevents binding up it's basically functioning as like a, a bearing i think i really do but you lose these things and you're just done so it is my understanding, or at least it used to be, you call up CoServe and you say, hey, what the heck? And they will send you three brand new monster links. And so that's how you do it. Um, though the, if you do want to just order it, there is the number. I don't think they have them anymore, but they might. I'm not sure. So that's something to check. I forgot to say. If you have to change one of these links, you're gonna do this out, do yourself a gigantic favor and get like a little tray, like, a, I don't know, something that's gonna contain the parts or if you're really worried about it, do it in a big gallon um, Ziploc bag so that if you're if you're fooling around with it and you lose it, it's like, oh, there it is. That That's a best practice. Okay, uh, next one is talking about, um, I had sort of an aside segment talking about um, the the Lady 62105. It's a 22050769, I think, but the cases are beautiful. The crown at three, but it has that same, you know, beautiful curved top um, case, uh, like flow, flowing around the crown guard. They're just beautiful. They're beautiful case design. And I was like, oh man, if Seiko came out and they did watch like this with this case, it'd be awesome. But I didn't think there was one. Okay. The Pulsar Y5146009 Quartz Diver from the 90s has the same case shape as the Seiko 2205 Lady Diver. Case size is 40 millimeters and it looks like an a Seiko SKX. I looked that up. I had completely forgotten about those. I and, well, I never had put the two together that because I knew about that before I knew about the Lady sixty one hundred fives. But I went and looked one up, and I'll be I'll be jiggered. You're one hundred percent right. And not only that, they're actually they're kind of hard to find. Um, their movements is uh, their movements are just a re number the Y. 514 is a 7548. That's what it is. Um, though I think it has one less jewel, so you could probably call it a 7546. Their circuits are brown plastic instead of green plastic, but they're identical otherwise. Four jewels, I believe. Um, but yeah, they're actually hard to find. But yeah, go and check that out. I completely forgot about those. Oh, they also use the same exact crown as the 6309 cushion case divers. So I'd forgotten, and now I've started looking for them. But boy, they're just like Yahoo Japan, nothing, not one. People must have had them and thrown them away. You talk about things that aren't worth anything, and all of a sudden they're worth something. I found one of these watches in the multiple worldwide sites that I looked at. Um, so they're hard to find. And now, of course, I'm looking for one, and... Uh, they're not easy to find. And I also just told all of you about it. But yes, you're 100% correct. Mayboss one. Um, watches and photography. This is about the Slim Case 6105 8000s. Watches and photography. Spencer, is the case length shorter on the vintage 6105 8009s compared to the modern reinterpretation. I love the K-shape and design, but it looks a little too long on the wrist compared to the more stout 6105 8110. 
I wish Seiko would have made a more true to the original design. Not a big fan of the Prospects logo on the dials. I like a cleaner, simpler dial without distracting logos and text. I, I very much agree about that. It's the only thing about the Marine Master that ever bugs me is it should have been a three line. It should have been a three line or a two line, not a four line, which just is like, it, it just, it's, I really like odd numbers and seeing that it's like, there's just one too many for me. I don't know because I don't have one of those. I have never seen one of those new Seikos that came out. I did see the Redune and they were, if I remember correctly, pretty much one-to-one -one, and their cache finishing was great. Um, Dial had some issues, but it would not surprise me if Seiko made them longer. That's exactly what they did with the uh, with their 6309 reissues. What the SRP 777, SRP 775, like that. And those were definitely longer, which is why basically the visual design of those were kind of ruined. When I look at one of those, I don't see a 6309. I see this modern thing, Seiko and their reinterpretations. Rolex versus Seiko, head to head. Uh, this person's name, uh, I believe, is a uh, obs uh, an ob a sort of leet spelling designed to obfuscate what the name actually is. F H A Q U U U. Rolex versus Seiko, head to head. Love that sub tritium, open six and nine date wheel. It's in great condition too. I've always wanted a 5513, but it's hard to find them in good condition and can be risky. It's true they wear so comfortably like your favorite pair of jeans. It's true. The Seiko Marine Master and even more modern turtles are like the Maxi K Submariner 116610 to current. Larger hour markers, ceramic bezels make a huge difference on the wrist, a huge difference on the wrist in day-to-day -day wear. Love for both. Yeah, the big ones, uh, when when... Rolex came out with the maxi subs. I was like, oh, they're kind of fallen prey to the current fashions, which at that time were like massive watches, 43, 44, 46, big heavy bracelets. This was the style at the time. I mean, look up the SUN019. I own one. I, I think I wore it on the original bracelet for two or three minutes, and I've never, oh no, and I tried it one more time. I was like, this is just, it, unwearable. It's so big and it's so heavy. Cannot do it myself. And so it looks like Rolex got into that. I prefer the earlier ones. They're simpler, more elegant. They feel like a more classic old school watch. Um, I just, I just think they're nice. I love the tritium. I just wish it glowed. That's the only thing. It's, I really like to be able to read a watch at night. I've considered getting another, putting that original handset away and getting another set of genuine Rolex hands that have badly damaged loom and relooming them with something that looks tritium but glows. That's actually, it's not a bad idea. That's not a bad idea at all. I'm going to have to go in there anyway because I have to adjust the, uh, the Microstella because it's gaining, what, four seconds a day? Five? No, no, no. I think we... I think I mathed it and it's like seven or eight seconds a day that thing's gaining. So I've got to go in there anyway. I'll consider that. Great idea. <sighs> yes. Still on the same one. Uh, Jam Bobby B124. The ultimate battle, Seiko versus Wilix. I have a sub, but I have more Seikos. I genuinely prefer my 7549-7010. 7549-7010 was Seiko's first, like, basically mid-sized tuna. Before that, it was only um, the grandfather tunas, which were the same size as like all the current big tunas, and, like Darth tuna and all that stuff. They're all the same exact size. Almost basically, I think they're the same exact case, just in different materials. The These things, 7549, 7010s, are, it's such a great design, and they just stand alone. Nothing looked like them before, and still to this day, nothing looks like them. Closest comes from Seiko itself. They still make this mid-sized tuna, but the first one, 7549-7010, it's just awesome. 
uh, on the old watch forum, the old Seiko collector watch forum, there was one of the old guys, been there forever, Harry Denmark, like Harry, like Prince Harry. Um, and he said once uh, on, the, on the board, he said, you know, if I lost if I did, if I lost every single watch that I had, I was down to one watch, and that one watch was seven five four nine seventy ten. I would still feel like a legitimate watch collector, because he was like, it's 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 the one. It's, so, and I get it. I understand what he's saying, and I'm there with him. And that's when I started looking at them more closely. My only complaint about them is like, you can't. I can't really wear them on leather. Bracelet, bracelet. I've never found a bracelet that really worked and looked right. I usually wear it on a on a on a new Seiko Z22 or something like that. But it's there's just I wish there were some other options for, that worked for those things. The hooded lugs due to the due to the shroud. It's such a beautiful watch and I just don't wear it as much as I should because of that problem. So I'd be curious you folks out there who have this model, what do you wear yours on? Please, I, I really want to know. I need suggestions. Uh, Seiko 6619-8280 Mac VSOG from Boyd Sergeant 7496. Thanks for this. I serviced and have a 6619A-9990, uh, which I can't get the quick date quick change to work it wants to work but it won't click over though do you know what usually wears to stop it working correctly how did you clean the top of the hands what was wrong with the mainspring arbor um <laughs> cheers ps oh my god do you know seikos i know parts of seikos i know pretty tight slot of knowledge that's not super deep so it actually it's it looks more impressive than it actually is. I I really narrowly focus, and there's so much Seiko stuff that I don't know, um, and because I remember everything uh, rather than taking notes, because I suck at taking notes, I have to remember everything, and so you know a lot of stuff drops out. That's why looking through the old catalogs is so fun for me, because I get reminded of all kinds of things and. I get to see stuff again, so, you know, it, it's just, it's, you know, it's super, uber cool. I'll put in a little thing here about the 6619s, because I don't remember. I don't work on them that often, I really don't. But I'll, I'll dig some out, we'll look at it. Let me make a uh, note here. Okay, 6619s. 6619s were a workhorse movement before um, Sui and Sua and Daini kind of started doing their own things. Uh, this was the sort of core movement for a lot of the entry-level watches in the middle and later 60s. Um, Seiko also sold these movements, much like, you know, uh, Seiko Instruments sells, you know, 7,000 series movements now. This watch belonged to a family friend. He was, he was in Normandy during World War II. He wasn't there. He didn't hit the beaches. He was a radio man and they kept putting him in uh, bomb craters. Anyway, but he left this to me after he passed. It's unrestored. It's original. But that's what they look like. Typical for these. It has a snap-on case back. Some of them are screwed down, but here is what one of these watches, one of these movements looks like when it's sitting in its watch. put that away back over there so now we get to the question why isn't the day the date quick set working so we're gonna look here it just you, you can't really see where that thing is but it's actually attached to this big big old screw right there that's the lever that when you push the crown in right there that lever is supposed to go click click but this one isn't working either so here's what it looks like when it's correct. It's interesting, by the way, this setup, that's very much, you can see, this is a prototype, like 7,000 series calendar keyless work setup. There you go, see that? You got that big fixed spring, and there's the lever, and that tip of the lever 
forge the date. Yeah, this is a very 7000 series setup. Very much so. So, we know that spring is supposed to be over there. This one does not work either. When we go over to, here is that lever. Let's, let's do this. Okay, so there it is, there's that lever. And we can see, I looked at this and I was like, oh, I see the problem. There's the spring. See that? It's on the wrong side. It's supposed to be over here. So instead of helping this spring back, it's actually preventing the lever from going forward. See, it wants to work, but it can't. So the cure for this is to get this up, over, and out, and back. I don't know if it can be done without jacking up the date wheel. This is just one of those things that you're just gonna have to get in there and fix. I would not recommend trying to spring that over. Yeah, but that's our problem right there. Right there. Let's see if I can get this one. Yes. Darn it. Ow. Turn it. Anyway, you can see where that lever is supposed to be right there, and you can see where it isn't right up there. So that is likely going to be your issue. Pretty simple if that's true. It's just annoying to fix. This is about the comment on the Sua versus Dini Caseback Spotters Guide from Velo1633. Hi guys, question for you. I just realized that my 1967-62 MAS Caseback does not have the Sua symbol under the word Seiko, it's a horseshoe back. I don't think it faded away as the rest of the text looks clear. Have you seen this before? Well. 67 is right basically when the whole Diney and Sua thing happened. Prior to that, they didn't even have their own branding. Um, that didn't really come in until really like 68, 69. I could be fuzzy on that one. I'm also not any kind of world expert on the variations of the 62 mass model. I'm really not. Um, I know there was an early small crown. They had the dolphin case back, which is what I have. And they had the horseshoe case back. Uh, it is my personal belief that the horseshoe case backs were made by Diney. I believe that's how it is, based on the construction of the case back, and that they were machined, not stamped. Sua liked spinning metal and stamping it, whereas Diney literally machined it up from a billet. Um, so I think that would be the main thing. And if that is true, if I'm correct, that would certainly explain why it doesn't have a Sua symbol. Diney helped out Sua a lot, a lot, a lot. Um, for, they made all the dials. The, that green loom that 62 MASs tend to have, that's, that's Diney loom. Um, and they, they helped with a lot of that. And of course, the evidence for that is that after the 62 MAS was discontinued, Diney Seiko came out with a 5126 model. 5126, ugh, I, I've talked about it recently. A 70 meter sport diver from 19 or late 1960s, but the dial is one to one. The 62 MAS dial was clearly made with the same blanks or on the same machinery or same tooling or whatever. It has different finishing paint colors, of course. Uh, it has day date, not just date, and of course the feet have been moved because it's a different movement, but the markers are identical, identical, and it was only starting to be produced after the 62 MES was discontinued. So I think that's a pretty good piece of conclusive evidence about who was making those dials, and those dials are solid. Um, I don't quite know how they did all the things that they did to it. Those, mar those markers are a marvel of engineering and, and production and QC. I don't know how they did it, but it was amazing.
salty crabs. I always walk away with your videos with so many questions. Me too. Um, how do you wash a dial? Extremely carefully, and even then things can go terribly wrong. Um, it depends on the condition of the dial. It depends on... Basically, when you're cleaning a dial, the less you can do, the better. Ideally, you don't touch the dial at all. But a lot of these old watch dials, they're going to have... If you look inside an old watch, there's usually like a haze inside the glass, and that's from the old lubricants outgassing. Uh, and that stuff gets on the dial too. It gets uh, humidity in there, deposits stuff because it's moving gases and oils around. So you have to just, sometimes you do a cleaning on the dials, and it is really amazing how much cleaner even a, a basically a mint condition dial would be. It, I, I hesitate to tell you how I do this because it is so easy to damage a dial. It is so, so easy. Um, basically, you do the lightest possible wash. I use a tiny, tiny, I, I get a, a beautiful sable paintbrush. One of my modeling ones. I've had it forever. Um, and I get a, a, just a tiny bit, tiny, tiny bit of dishwasher, like, I mean, tiny, like a couple, three pin heads worth with um, room temperature distilled water. And you very carefully wash the dial. You wash the dial and you can see, you know, that you should be able to see the bubbles coming up and the water, sh you know, will, uh, will, blah, blah, blah. it won't roll off basically. You know, it, it skins the whole thing. So as you're washing it and you're pulling off the grease and all the, 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 you know, the grot of ages, all of a sudden you'll see that water starting to beat up again to the original thing. Then I take my canned air and I very gently spinning the dial and I very gently blow it out. I'm also holding the dial up very carefully with a special set of tweezers that I use that were not intended for that purpose, but they work pretty well. The problem is, is if the watch dial has ever been, has been compromised by water or moisture or humidity or flexing or any of this stuff, you don't know what, you, if you're not 100% sure what you got going on, you can do things where, you know, dial's a lot more delicate than you think, and you can start going through these cleaning processes on a semi-damaged dial, and like you can strip the clear coat right off. It, it just like, it goes away and it takes the words with it. Um, you just have to be really, really careful and very hesitant to do it. And I still, I still have to be just extremely slow and very careful because if you mess up and you have to start cleaning the dial because you screwed up the last time you cleaned the dial, the more you touch a dial, the, the greater the chances that you're going to damage it in some way. That's what I do. It's an easy, easy thing to say. It's a hard thing to do correctly. I still have trouble with it. If you're going to try to clean your dial, my re my recommendation, don't worry about washing stuff. Use Rotico. Uh, Rotico is the tool that works. And I often use Rotico. I wash dials because it really gives a zing to it, but that's me. And the risk to the dial can be substantial. And I don't think the risk is a decent trade-off. So that's my recommendation. If you're working on a dial, Get yourself some finger cots, get some Rotico, get your uh, get your little dial holder diddly, get your good magnification, and just work it over with the Rotico. That's what I would recommend. Let's go for the next one. Yeah, I know I've answered that one. I answered that one. Okay. So now we're on to MG stuff. So if you don't care about MG stuff, then you can sign off. Thanks for watching though. Okay, this is on the video about my MG. My MG is already not stock. I subbed in an early dash. That was the title of the video. Uh, Michael O'Neill 3653 uh, said about the rust in my rockers. Um, 
that rust isn't that bad. My rubber bumper had a ton of rust and unfortunately I did not have the funds to fix it. Bats are so neat. Oh, BGTs. BGTs are so great. Bats are neat too. You realize they're the most, they're, they're the greatest number of species. I think that they account for half of all mammals, like no joke. Pretty amazing. And bats are the second, you want to talk about convergent evolution? I was I was in a museum and I was looking at a reconstruction of a ter of pterosaur, you know, flapping through the air, flap, flap. Uh, they were uh, reptile flyers with, and I was looking up at this thing and I'm like, it's like making a bat out of a out of a reptile, except the other way, which is that the bat was, you know, evolution and um, a particular niche being evolved into by a mammal, making a bat out of a pterosaur. Big heads, uh, wings that are centered on the arms with skin extensions, extremely short legs. So the center of gravity is like kind of be like under the shoulders like in this thing, rather than a bird, which is, may have a longer body and different aerodynamics. So basically I was like, oh, so for some reason there's some advantage to that body design where a big head and skin covered wings and extremely small back legs works. So works for bats and it works for pterosaurs. So remember, next time you see a bat, that's what happens when you, uh, you, you make a pterosaur out of a mammal. Um, Oh yeah, I was talking about bats. No, I was talking about BGTs. Yeah, the rust is not bad. I looked through, man, I was, because I've been looking for a parts BGT. Um, I've been looking through a lot of listings, man. And there was one that was like, the floor was gone. Like it was gone. Like the square of the floor simply wasn't there anymore. You know, hideous rust all around the wheel wells. And I was going to go through it. This ain't that bad. You know, seeing some other stuff, it's not bad. I have my, uh, I have my, um, I have my cutters ready to go. I have my welder ready to go. I have to get the metal to replace the rockers. Uh, I have, I have the floor for the trunk. I need to get the full floors and the rockers. And there's a thing called British Heritage. And so the parts, these pieces of sheet metal are made, or at least they were, they were made by former MG people on the correct equipment. It's supposed to be, they're perfect. So I have to get some of those, but then start cutting stuff out. Anybody who's watching this, who's ever used a rotisserie jig on a car, uh, I really wanna hear from you about how that went, because I'm considering it. The way this is working out, this car, I will, by the time I'm done, I will have touched almost or all of the bolts or anything in this car. The whole thing's coming apart. I thought I was going to be able to get it, like get it running, and drive it around. I might have been able to, now that I know a little more, but I'm into it. And everything I touch, I'm like, thank goodness I'm taking this thing apart because this thing needs, you know, work. I don't know. But so I'm, I'm thinking I'm going to strip the whole body and I'm going to replace, cut out all this stuff. It would be so much easier to put it on a rotisserie. I just don't know if it's worth it because they're expensive. Also, one guy said somewhere that you have to be really careful because if you don't do your rotisserie right, it'll jack your unibody frame up and I don't want to do that. So if anybody knows about that, that'd be fan blastic tastic Uh, wheel dog five, five, five. Um, the braze. Oh, I talked about there was where there's some welding over in front where the understructure underneath the front fenders meets the body just in front of the doors. Uh, and it's it's brazed, it's brass brazed, and I was and it was hand brazed. I'm like, that's wild. I wonder if that's a repair. Wheel dog five 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 five. The brazing keeps the spot welds from failing when the front apron flexes under use. Resistant spot welds fatigue quickly under stress. If the cowl, upper apron, and radiator support are solid, you're good. Make sure those front rails and rockers are boxed in with all good steel. They are. They are structurally critical. Well, they're there, so that's good. I never used one of those rotisseries, but that should make the job much more pleasant. Make sure all the rails are, make sure the rails are all good and solid. That's what keeps the car off the ground. I agree. I really want to do, I want to do it. I want to do it right. I want to do it like I'm doing a watch, which is where everything comes apart. I want to be able to see everything and 
verify everything and have it the way it needs to be. And I don't, I don't want guessing. I watch a lot of Vice Grip Garage and other things like that. Um, you know, a lot of these auto rescue um, shows on YouTube where, you know, people go and they're like, you know, they find a 71, a rare 71 Ford Torino or something that's been parked behind a, a barn in Minot for the last, you know, 30 years. And he goes there and he, I literally looked at one last night. He had a, he had a Ford Grand Torino from like 1976, something like that. But it had been sitting next to a barn in North Dakota for 30 something odd years. And the engine was locked up and it they had been sitting in one spot for so long that the wheels had sunk into the grass. And he and his brothers moved that thing. They got the engine free. Oh, and the car had been full of mice. So all the wiring in the engine compartment got eaten up. Oh, and I think the brakes, brake lines were bad or something, but they got the engine running. But all the work he did, he had to like make this ad hoc wiring system. He had to do all this stuff with, he had to rebuild the car, of course, but he had to swap wheels and stuff, but he drove it all at home. Basically he does what he has to do just enough to be able to get it and drive it home. He drove that thing 600 miles home. I, I understand that and I admire it, but I am not a fan of being like worrying about, okay, when is something going to go? So I'm going to go through everything now and assuming I do my job right on this stuff, hopefully I shouldn't have to worry about it, but who knows, man. <clears throat> oh, it's Speedy Paul 2314. This is, I was talking about a, uh, putting, um, uh, a sunroof in this thing. I would get one, but no, I don't have any way to fit it myself. Get a professional to cut the roof hole and install. That's true. I agree. Amazingly, I cannot believe this. You can't get them anymore. But the stock sunroofs that were installed in these things were made by a second, a different company, a third party company. And you could until, I don't know, maybe a decade ago, you could still get them. And they were ingeniously made. They come with jigs and um, uh, locating points. And the whole thing is designed so that you are held top and bottom. Initially, you drill, it has jig marks. It has all the jig marks you can drill through and then you cut through right on the jig mark. And then the whole thing is kind of a clamshell. I mean, you, you cut the hole on the inside right through the headliner. And then you have this clamshell, it's like fitted, right? You have the top of the thing and the under of the thing. Um, and it's got a, an edge that goes out and it traps the corners of the headliner. And then the top has some kind of crazy sealant and it, it goes in, it's the stock one. And it, it actually, it, it's powered and it went zick like so. Can't find them anymore. But if I found one of those, it's a kit. Um, you could do it. And it, I watched the video. It didn't even take the, that long because it's kind of idiot proofed. I think that would be neat. I think that would be neat. The last things now I have to do is I have to, um, last things. I have to drop the whole drivetrain. I have to pull the dash. I have to pull the engine. I have to pull what's remaining of the electrical wiring harness. I need to strip all the stainless steel and chrome off of it. Um, and then... Well, there's all this stuff underneath, you know, emergency brake cables and brake lines, and I'm going to be replacing all of that too. So basically I'm ripping out everything to the point that this thing is a shell and then I'll work it back from there. It's going to be a long project, but I want it to be right. I want it to be right. Anyway, that's it. So thank you much. Uh, my lovely wife is probably going to be returning home in just a few minutes, but you know what? She missed the action. So thank you so much for watching. I appreciate it very much. If you could hit, you know, like and subscribe with that little alarm, you know, bell thing, notification, I would really appreciate it. That helps us a lot. And we're just a mom and pop business. So, you know, if you can help us out, we would certainly appreciate it. Uh, and that's about it. Oh, last reminder, we buy watches. So if you need to sell any watches, maybe let us know about it. Maybe we can buy some watches. Do a deal. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you.